The natural world provides a sometimes overwhelming abundance in the variety of material and events that we can observe. It is for this reason that we have developed methodology, such as the scientific method, as well as schemes of classification to try and understand this otherwise recalcitrant universe. In many ways, we are always looking for patterns in nature and labeling them in such a way as to make connections or to see the frequency of occurrences. One thinks of the periodic table of chemical elements in chemistry, the classification of forces in physics, and of course the taxonomic classification of life in biology. All give us a sense of confidence in our understanding of the world. In many cases, however, these systems of classification go beyond the surface of what we can see or even experience with our senses, and so in science, what we consider intuitively to be common knowledge should never be taken for granted to be true. In many cases this has happened in history. Think of the geocentric model of the universe, and of the theories of motion in ancient Greece, or of the idea that life on Earth today arose in its present state at the same time that the Earth was formed. It was not until people such as Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel became genuinely confused and puzzled at these notions that the dogma of established but nevertheless incorrect knowledge from the ancient world would eventually be toppled and replaced with modern, scientifically verifiable and most importantly, falsifiable evidence. In the classification of plants, for example, we can be tempted to base our classification systems for plant life on Earth on superficial surface similarities and end up making assumptions about where certain species fit into the tree of life, often with erroneous results. For example, here in the Canary Islands we see a huge variety of plant species, some native, but most introduced by humans. In the hot, arid climate of deserts, access to water is the greatest problem faced by life here. Those plants that can optimize their retention of bodily water can rule the land, and have evolved over many generations to do so. For this reason, we may be tempted to point at two plants who look very similar to each other and refer to them as being in the same familial grouping. We may even go on to make a classification hierarchy to place them in. If, if left unquestioned, this classification system may become common knowledge without it ever being scientifically verified. By questioning what our natural eyes see, we can make more subtle and often more impactful understanding of the intricate ways nature operates on living systems. For example, the iconic plant native to Gran Canaria, Euphorbia canariensis, sometimes called the Canary Island Club Cactus, is in fact not in the cactus family at all. It is more closely related to the leafy Christmas poncetta than to the true cacti. The true cacti that grow alongside Euphorbia canariensis are the artificially introduced Echinopsis and Opuntia cacti that are originally native to the Americas. Cacti in the Americas originated from shrub-like plants from the Andes Mountains in Peru, and Euphorbia canariensis is descended from a leafy spurge plant that may have arrived from seeds drifted on waves from Africa. The genus Euphorbia is one of the largest genera of flowering plants. It also has one of the largest ranges of chromosome counts, which creates the vast diversity we see in the physiology of the Poncetta versus the Euphorbia canariensis. Even though these two plants are in the same genus, they couldn't look more different. Cacti on Euphorbias, on the other hand, are separate genera, and even though they look very similar, they are in reality very distantly related to one another. Cacti and Euphorbias have been shaped independently of their genetics by the similar environments they inhabit. For example, they have both evolved to eliminate external leaves, thus reducing the surface area from which bodily water can be lost from transpiration. Instead of using leaves, they can perform photosynthesis in their columnar stem, which is ridged to shield the plant from the dry air of the desert. Just as with the true cacti, the desert-dwelling euphorbias use equivalent ways to deter herbivores. While the cactus like euphorbs do contain spines, these are not usually as big or painful as the ones that cacti employ. Euphorbias instead primarily use a latex containing diterpenes, a group of highly toxic chemicals that can badly poison or even kill anything that attempts to consume them. These chemicals even have antimicrobial properties, making them virtually invulnerable even to microorganisms. It has been theorized that the extinct giant tortoises of the Canary Islands 
used to feed on these plants, but since their extinction, the Euphorbia canariensis grows unopposed. The true cacti, on the other hand, often have larger, and in the case of the Umpuncia, or prickly pear, have more irritating spines, and their main means of chemical defense is to make use of alkaloids, which primarily cause the cactus plants to taste extremely bitter and unpalatable to all but the most persistent plant predators. The question that, that naturally arises in face of this challenge to our assumptions is why does it look like a cactus if it is not really a cactus? This leads us to the discovery that evolution by natural selection molds plants to survive with the most efficient body plan in their respective environments. To survive in arid and desertified conditions is tough. It is a very specialized environment with a lot of constrained variables. Access to water is one of the most constraining variables of all. Therefore, there are very few body plants that are optimized to thrive in a desert for extended periods of time. Only a few possible ways to make a living will emerge in a desert, which we, we call ecological niches. Nature itself creates external selection pressures on living bodies to favor the plants that will survive at their particular niches. What we see in this case is a very interesting effect of natural selection known as convergent evolution, which is when two separate kinds of life evolve the same optimized body plan, or the same specialized niche. This is a more subtle understanding of how the environment shapes life than just trusting our assumptions alone. What makes convergent evolution even more intriguing is that it may very well be a universal principle of biology, and we could use it in principle to speculate how life throughout the universe may evolve equivalent body plans to the specialized species of plants and animals we see on Earth. Who knows? Maybe on some distant rocky planet or moon, the alien equivalent of cacti could be thriving, perhaps with completely different biochemistry and using different light frequencies than the plants on Earth, but perhaps looking strangely familiar on an otherwise unfamiliar landscape. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. The support and feedback I have been getting from viewers and supporters of this work have been very positive, and I hope to continue making more videos on topics in science and technology in the future.